Hey everybody, how are you guys doing? I'm Eric Gerlach, and this is another talk on philosophy, French thought, and Lacan, much like pecan pie, yes, of France. This is about Jacques Lacan. Uh, Lacan, pecan, pecan, if you're American, and hopefully I'm not the biggest narcissist, because I can admit not only does Lacan believe that narcissism is the human condition, or perhaps that of politics, this is America, but Lacan believes that narcissism is the human condition. One of the telltale signs of narcissism is never admitting you're wrong, and I actually recorded this lecture entirely, uploaded it for about 20 seconds, and then realized I had the sound off. So I'm going to re-record this lecture, and that was, I was actually decently happy with 40-minute talk, and then, yeah, I didn't record any of that. So hopefully these will be even better jokes. How could they not be? So Jacques Lacan uh, is one of the structuralists, and we have been talking here about Levi Strauss. I'm still doing a couple of French uh, philosophers here rounding out the modern philosophy and the French philosophy for the semester. And so we are getting from the structuralists to the post-structuralists, which is Foucault centrally, to then post-modernism. And then that'll finish out the French folks. So we got to do about three folks here. We got to do Lacan, Bart, and then Foucault, who are the structuralist slash post-structuralists. And then we are going to be going on to the postmodernists, including Lyotard, Deleuze, Baudrillard, and Derrida. So, as we've been talking about, structuralism and Levi-Strauss says that there are certain, uh, unlike the existentialists, Sartre and others, who believe that you are horribly free, as Kierkegaard said, you are dazzled by the openness of this especially modern mechanized world, which is frightening in its lack of meaning and openness. And so you have to kind of strike out into the dark as an individual for existentialism. Structuralism came back against that and said, actually, you're pretty much determined by your culture. The world's still horrible, post-war, French thought. But existentialism moves from the freedom of the individual to and the open horror of the individual at the radical openness and chaos and confusion. Camus said absurdism versus Sartre's existentialism. The absurdism of the world that this then moves from that to structuralists saying, well, you're pretty much completely determined, have no free will, and you are determined even if you want to be countercultural by your culture and counterculture, and there is no real individuality, to then post-structuralism and post-modernism, which is Foucault and Derrida, Baudrillard, and others, wrestle with how free an individual and existential things are, or structural and how determined completely by your society and language and social constructs and identities that you participate in and forms of behavior in life, most Pavlovian and behavioral science style. French thought, again, um, unlike analytic thought, is very biologically grounded, very anthropologically grounded, whereas analytic stuff tends to hug more to math logic uh, in the abstract, actually and then claim objective real truth, of course. So Lacan is the second of the structuralists we're going to study. He studied Nietzsche, Hegel, Heidegger, and Jaspers while studying medicine to be a psychiatrist. Uh, as Ricky Ricardo said, a physiatrist. I mentioned that Lacan attended uh, Kozhev's lectures on Hegel with Bataille and that he tried to systematize Nietzsche using Freud. Uh, Lacan became a psychiatrist in the 20s and married Bataille's estranged wife. She might be quite estranged given Bataille, already talked too much about that, and probably will talk too much more. Uh, while, uh, while Lacan was involved with the Surrealists of Paris, which again, Lacan uh, was actually tighter with Breton than Bataille was. Um, Lacan's thesis, Paranoid Psychosis and Its Relations to the Personality, was an influence on many Surrealists, such as Dali and Breton, both personal friends of Lacan. He was also a contributor to Surrealist journals and Picasso's personal physician. It's like, is this your ear? You know? Oh, that's Van Gogh's. Lacan is most famous for his theory of the mirror stage. Lacan is famous for a couple basic ideas. I am not the biggest psychoanalysis fan. My grandfather was a psychoanalyst. He moved into Gestalt 
And how do you feel about that? You know, not really your mother's a complex. How do you feel about your mother open-ended? You know, is much more kind of Heideggerian existential. Well, it's kind of open and interpretive. As I always joke, I uh, steal the joke from the Reddits. Uh, why does Rorschach keep painting pictures of my parents fighting? So with all of that, this is heavy interpretation, subjectivity, philosophy, and psychology. Lacan is was a French Freudian who created a whole school of psychoanalysis, French psychoanalysis, Lacanian psychoanalysis, which some Freudians believe is heretical, some Lacanians think and psychoanalysts think is golden, and many others think Freud and Lacan are both nuts. Uh, but Freud and Lacan have their place in several ideas which are still popular in psychology, and psychology is not yet very much a settled field, and I'll leave that to psychologists to describe or not, but that's been a little in the news over the past couple of years, and again, uh, psychology has always been my favorite science, the one closest to me in my family, and anthropology, I think, would come much next because culture. And cultural psychology, yes. So, along with philosophy for me. And I took as many classes as I could back in the day. I did not take much on psychoanalysis. I have my Wittgensteinian beefs with Freud, as well as Lacan. But Lacan is very important for understanding his key core ideas that he believes is truly what Freud was thinking, which others say, no, he's adding that in. One of them, as already mentioned, is that uh, narcissism is the basic human condition, not just of one or two individuals you might immediately think of in your friends, family, or politicians. But he is also very famous for his theory of the mirror stage. Now, uh, Lacan is giving this before Piaget, and I like Piaget, and I like his sort of somewhat, I guess you could call it a bit, behaviorist child developmental psychology. I like Gobnik's The Philosophical Baby. I recommend that book a lot. As she mentions that children are fascinated with Oscar the Grouch uh, on Sesame Street because they, three and four, learning language and perspective. And there's a lot of insight to be had in that about how our reality folds into what it is. And Lacan would be very much on page with that phrasing, I think, possibly in the French. Because Lacan is very famous for his theory of the mirror stage. And the mirror stage is sort of still decently true, just as much of Piaget is still decently true, but I'm sure it goes under other guises and names and nomenclature. So, as toddlers, around the age of two, three, and four, we are learning to speak language, which means we are learning to talk to others and simultaneously talk to ourselves and think. Now, I'm going to leave that very loose, because actually there's a lot of Wittgenstein to get into there, and I love getting into it, and I'll leave all that right off the table right here. And Wittgenstein would actually fly in the face of a lot of psychoanalysis, because they empty. Uh, it's very much about emptying out the basement, and there really isn't a secret level in you. It's more the social constructs and forms of life outside of you that you are fully a part of mentally and physically. So it's inside, it's outside. It's something like behaviorism without thinking the individual is simply a zombie. Something like that we are experienced and how we behave. And there really doesn't need to be a hidden Freudian, Freudian layer of complexes. But Lacan, in his describing uh, Freudian psychology, which does believe in stages, uh, complexes that an individual can get into, such as the Oedipal complex, etc. Lacan has many thoughts on all that, and again, we are just going to cover the very basics of Lacan that are interesting for philosophy and post-structuralism. Moving to postmodernism, and Lacan is a big influence in French thought, Lacan on, uh, and onward, and but uh, Baudrillard, for instance, is very into Bataille and Lacan, So, and he died in 2005, so to understand French thought, you should know a bit about Lacan, even though I'm only going to tell you the bit that I like plenty, of course, um, with this shorter talk. But the mirror stage, as we are learning to think and talk, we are learning to form the basics of our reality. If you will follow me that far, then the toddler is learning, is in a mirror stage, according to Lacan, where the toddler is trying, is looking in mirrors. Now, you don't have to have a mirror. I did actually object when I first heard this idea. I said, but all cultures don't have mirrors. This, of course, has been plenty anticipated. And as this th thinking rolled into the 60s, it clearly is that people do see themselves in a cup of water or a stream or a pond decently as well as then also often have mirrors. The ancient Egyptians had mirrors, some consisting of glass, some polished brass, I believe. Whether or not a culture has mirrors 
cultures do have enough water and, and surfaces around, let's say natural, you know, formations, etc. well, water, um, that they can see reflections of themselves. And the toddler is sees themselves think about how many times you walk in front of a mirror i constantly look over here and i'm like oh my hair is terrible i actually brushed it believe it or not i am not good with <laughs> stylist i ain't but verbiage i will so onward orator the mirror stage is when the child first starts looking in a mirror or a stream and starts to try and this is very heideggerian try to form a stable self-image, which, as Lacan says, and this is the deep part of Lacan, which is a good idea and very interesting, whether or not it's entirely true, it's a very interesting theory. What Lacan says is that at the age of two and three, as we start to form words and talk and thoughts with ourselves and others, we get attached to the image of ourselves in the mirror or in the stream, we are also attached to the image of, say, mommy and daddy and trying to act like a male or a female, let's say loosely or something like that, where we're trying to play social roles, gender, ethnicity, jobs. We are, again, socially constructed beings in these uh, ways of Hegelian thinking. Lacan is very Hegelian and Heideggerian. So we are very socially constructed beings. And so for the rest of our lives, Hegel said, the feeling of being in contradiction which one's, with oneself is the feeling of being alive, also being in error, thus misspeaking slightly. So as toddlers, we are constantly trying to cling to an image of self. We continue to do this the rest of our life. If you think something like Buddhism here, we are constantly attached to whatever we see in the mirror. Think about how many times I started to say you walk by a mirror, you look in the mirror, and it's a bit different from what you thought, and you kind of adjust your appearance and are sometimes not very happy with it. We are never how we idealize our own image from the time we are toddlers, is what Lacan is saying. And if you watch the Heidegger stuff, or you listen to it. I, you know, you don't need to watch it. You can just hear me talk a bunch. I will mention in those Heidegger talks that Heidegger is very into that you are never perfectly stable and the world is never perfectly stable. There is never, uh, you as an individual, you can never, for Heidegger or Lacan, fully say, I know the complete objective truth of the world, now it's fixed, I can trust it 100%, nor can you do the yin-yang the opposite way inwards and say, I know what I mean completely, rather than check yourself against others. So what's happening is the toddler, as the toddler is entering into parental Freudian, perhaps, relationships with the parents, the toddler is trying to form a stable self-image, and for the rest of our lives, according to Heidegger and Lacan, we never have a stable perfect self, nor do we ever have a stable reality. And that is the two-way yin-yang of it that's most important for lining up Lacan with Heidegger. There is never, for any single individual on Earth, a perfectly coherent objective truth, nor is there a perfectly coherent subjective truth. It's always somewhat in motion and open-ended. It is not that nothing can be said. It's just X and Y, good night, everybody. Self and world are completely unknown. But we are always a social and self-construct in progress, and so is our reality from the time we are toddlers. That is what Lacan is saying. And I would say psychology doesn't completely deny any of that plenty. And sort of would along the lines of Piaget, post-Piaget psychology, I would say, which is not my field to talk entirely about, but as a history of thought person, fool, fooly haha, Lacan is coming up with something about the toddler forming a stable self-image, which is very much like earlier with Sartre, Fanon is one of the first major anti-racists who says black, in black skin and white masks, black people have to constantly be have dual consciousness in trying to be white enough and never being white. In a certain sense, very much like that, the toddler wants to be an adult and never, and of course is idealizing mommy and daddy in a way that mommy and daddy never can, or daddy and daddy whomever, you know what I mean? I'm from the Bay, yay out here in Cali, that if with all of whatever your stable image is or is not, 
And of course, here it's more or less authentic, more or less transparent, more or less wise, more or less competent, knowing happy, knowing what it's doing, but always open-ended. The individual never knows enough to fully have a complete self. The individual never knows enough to have a complete world. It is symbiotic, like the yin-yang. Heidegger, again, wanted to get more, more into Taoism and was trying to. That's what's happening is, is Lacan is describing a very Piaget-like toddler stage that is very Heidegger-speak. If you check out the Heidegger and the yin-yang of the self-world, how the self and world are open and closed, and that's the anxious, terrible dance step of, of the self and the mind and the reality, and the open horizon as horrifying, Lacan is describing this sort of Heideggerian thought in terms of what a toddler is doing, and then all of us in terms of a self-image. I love to go on and on with Nietzsche about how don't trust objectivity, even in the guise of modern science. The reason that I do is not because I ever want to encourage anybody to be an anti-vaxxer. I sincerely do not. At the same time, there are a lot of jerks who say I'm stable, or science, or religion, or politics is stable. None of it ever is. That's the Heideggerian thought here, and that's the valuable teaching moment of this Lacanian stuff. It is not that you shouldn't make judgments. It isn't that we have no idea whether the Democratic or Republican Party or any parties ever stood for anything. It is that it is always open-ended and open to further interpretation. As Poe would say, and I like, uh, further open to genius. Yes? Further open to radical interpretation. So, given that the self and world are both open and closed... The toddler is dealing with this from the mirror stage onward, and that is why, say, I wear black t-shirts, I'm growing my hair out long, because we're conforming to certain sorts of things we do and don't see, and we're never entirely comfortable. I wear a lot of black t-shirts, and I'm leaving my hair out, so apparently I'm comfortable enough. But, we're never fully comfortable. Think about how much you look over, you know, how the grass is always greener, the monkey mind of the Buddhist jumping around, chattering away always to some other branch. It fits very well with the Buddhist monkey mind. So, as toddlers, we form a stable image and conception of ourselves by looking at others and our own reflection, then cling to it in the attempt to resolve the flux and contradictions of our thoughts and feelings, and then repress or redirect whatever does not conform to this image. You know, people are kind of full of it, you know, and they're like always acting like hypocritical jerks. This is basically the Heideggerian Lacanian answer, major answer as to why. Because people do not have a stable self, and so they cling to things in order to have a stable self. Which is the mammal we are trying to burrow, in a sense. I would say be most behaviorist-like. Uh, so Lacan's work centers on narcissism. Now notice if we're trying to get a self-image stable, notice how this is ocular-centric also. It, it could be self, like, do it, give yourself a pat on the back, you know, both hands hug. See, in your mind, you know, hug everyone. Now, dang it, the uh, Lacan's work centers on narcissism. Not merely self-love, it's self-obsession in the sense that the individual cannot deal, can't even, as the teenagers used to say. After the young child forms an image of self and begins to cling to it, the child forms narcissistic complexes. Now, everyone does, better or worse. All of us are narcissists, according to Lacan, so we better or worse make narcissistic complexes as ourselves. And all of it is all of it. We're not Ayn Rand here. There is altruism. It does exist. But essentially, narcissistic complexes are the form of human personalities, thus, is it would suggest. Forms of excluding self from other, or identifying with this or that, versus this or that, yes, culturally, counterculturally, left and right, yes, that attempt to establish stability in an inevitably insecure situation. The ego is an inauthentic agency. I like that, the inauthentic agency. It's like a terrible uh, detective service. Concealing its own unstable lack of unity. Note the Heidegger speak about authenticity here. Freud had wondered why narcissism develops early in children but is not present from the beginning. And Lacan believed he had solved this problem with his mirror stage and the formation of self-image. Narcissism fragments the world in attempting to cling to a coherent self, and anxiety becomes paranoia. Now, this is very Heidegger. Because Heidegger says there is basically, sort of, when we're authentic, we face anxiety and we know it isn't really... This is my paraphrasing, and many Heideggerians, again, get upset with slight deviations from Heideggerianism. Z, yeah. Uh, that 
anxiety, staring at raw anxiety is kind of as authentic as a human being can be because as soon as all, as anxiety's hooked up to this or that, we're being fooled and kind of chased into things by it as our own selves and world all together as one and here being and there being all together. And so anxiety, basically the basic energy and anxiety that we are at base becomes fear of particular things, paranoia. We take the energy and the discomfort, the feeling of being in contradiction with ourselves as being alive for Hegel. We then take this basic anxiety to whom, uh, to who we are, to whom and who we are, maybe all around here and there. Yes, that, uh, as the Upanishads would say. So you have here that the self breaks the self into self and other, the self projects. Now projection is a very big Freudian concept and projection in hypocrisy and human beings being jerks is something famous, right? Freud is still decently right about projection. That's one of the words of Freud that people use all day long, you know, about other people. That's so what happens is we are basically anxious. So we form complexes of being afraid of this and that in order to form a stable self, which we never fully have. It's a it's sort of like a mammal never has a fully stable burrow. And this is earth, uh, at least in earthquake country out here. So, and given predators and other things in the seasons and change. So given change and instability and things like with the monkey mind of Buddhism, Disunity and contradiction are projected onto the world and others away from the self and social selves with which the self identifies. I believe in this stuff decently. Um, I am not the big Lacanian, nor am I the psychoanalyst. Uh, I really like Wittgensteinian, one could call it behaviorism. Um, uh, pragmatic behaviorism, perhaps, although there's better words than behaviorism because that has a bad name for a couple of things and uh, we're not zombies uh, or a black box. But essentially, we all are hypocritical and not coherent. All of us are incoherent without total logic. I am a logic teacher. Whenever anybody tells me they're logical, I ask them how they never give me a straight answer. The reason is because none of us are completely consistent or logical in the same way none of us are immortal perfectly down here, right? I don't know about, uh, again, as Confucius says, you're worried about the afterlife, you don't know how to live this life, and you're worried about feeding ghosts and spirits, and you can't feed people. And he certainly did believe in the ghost spirits and afterlife. So whether or not there are the blessings of afterlives and life, etc., as far as being here, there is a great deal of incoherence, contradiction, mortality, and projection of all of this on the things one hates and fears. So let me put it like this. I am a decently left-wing individual, right? It would be thus very easy for the monkey mind I have to think that right-wing people do not make total sense to themselves and that they are incoherent and don't fully know what they're doing. Now, the Buddha says himself, and I actually imagine some of these Germans are familiar with the words of the Buddha himself. All people run around so often bad-mouthing others cannot admit to the same faults themselves. That people are projecting, the Buddha effectively says this in the Dhammapada, and it does fit with Lacan to the degree I do believe in the ideas of Lacan, and Lacan has a lot of other ideas that I'm not sure about. The problems largely we have oftentimes have to do something with, to give Lacan a decent amount of credit here for the, uh, the ideas I do think fit well with Heidegger and our lives. And I'm not that Heideggerian, again. What you can see is that everyone is insecure. We can use, and modern psychologists would read all this as I do and call it insecurity. Yes, there's narcissism, self-centeredness, ego, insecurity, lots of words. Yes, none of us fully know what's going on. We project that lack and, and fear into others. So it is easy for me as a left winger to say right wingers act like they don't know what they're doing. Well, technically all of us act like we don't know what we're doing and we have a great deal of problems seeing and feeling that we ourselves don't. Now notice what Nietzsche and Heidegger would suggest, but deepening however accidental or truly individually intentional it is. If we open up to how we are not completely coherent and we can see and be more developed tough sea legs, uh, sea legs and a tough stomach, for the sea, as Schopenhauer says, we can be more transparent. There, I saw a Buddhist image once. It's a uh, one of the uh, it's a meme, high impact font. Buddhist monk meditating by a uh, stream. It says, "Relax, nothing is under control." 
It is very Lacan, it is very Heidegger, and it is very Wittgenstein. And I put all of this in terms of Wittgenstein because it's simple pragmatism and simple speak without needing uh, psychoanalytic complexes deep within the skull somewhere we haven't found yet. Or Jungian archetypes, either. As set in stone or anything like that, rather than social practices and roles outside of ourselves that we then soak up and get into and learn as our innermost selves. No one has a fully stable self or a perfect argument for anything. I can tell you that as a philosophy and logic instructor. I have never met it myself, nor am I that. And yet I have such problems with people continuously, people I love, family and friends, who go on and on and on and won't listen and, and project things into others. And then I quietly just smile and say, okay, so where's the coherency here on your side? And they're like, well, I don't know. You know, and it's... Unfortunately, all we can do is be patient with ourselves and others and get better about this. This is everyone. This is something we all deal with. Narcissism is the human condition. And how much can we go back and forth with self and others symbiotically, or how much do we close up to it? And uh, as John Dewey, who knew his Heidegger as a pragmatist, and I will get to do in a video about him, said soon, he said, uh, you can close up to the world like a clam. That's a way of treating the world and, and uh, interacting with it. It's a terrible way, but it's a way, you know? So you can shut all of this out or say, no, I do have morals and logic, unlike those tribal people. Unfortunately, for, to the end, as Buddha said, ah, not Buddha, my favorite Zen master, Joshu, is asked, what's the meaning of Buddhism? And he tells the Buddhist monk, a thousand years ago in China, to the end of time, you will never single it out. To the end of time, to the end of your life, you will always be somewhat in contradiction with yourself. You will always be somewhat in contradiction with others. You will always have a reality which is somewhat incoherent and hypocritical. The reason why I actually constantly tell people to doubt objective truth, even in the name of science and, and push hard pragmatism and interpretationism, is because Nietzsche and Heidegger, as much as Heidegger was a Nazi, and I'm not into that at all, we're very worried about people believing in the morality of religion or the logic of science when there actually is no coherent morality to or logic to any human thought. Let me double down and say that one more time. What I mean is if Christians are imperfect and scientists are imperfect unto human error, there is no coherent morality or logic in human behavior or talk, not completely. It is always ideal beyond that. It is an image, a static thing we aspire to. Something like coherence, something like non-contradiction. There is no such thing as complete non-contradiction, and yet we are constantly projecting that into others rather than allowing it to be transparently simply there as our innermost living selves, as our hearts and minds, actually, in contradiction with each other, in contradiction with themselves. That is basically the mirror stage leading into narcissism fragmenting the world. So what you will notice is people could pull inward. They could say, well, I have a secret doctrine. I know what I'm doing. I'm just going to do this thing. Or they could get into the world and become a real fascist. Uh, Lacan is thinking about Nazis specifically. Nietzsche was thinking about Nazis. Heidegger was a Nazi. How do people become Nazis? How do people become hardliners? Or how do they become zealots? Because they're looking for stability in something. And let's leave it there and let's not judge any more than that, yeah? Because, of course, I'm not, and with Heidegger and Lacan, it's important to mention, authenticity and inauthenticity are not something you just choose and you can simply see. Otherwise, it would, yeah, not be the issue of how transparent can it get. So, with all of this, and there really is, it's hard to even then mention, and students do want, it's like, what sort of activity could I say, finger paint, or maybe talk to people? I would have people talk to people, learn about more cultures in order to reflect. That's been good for philosophical skepticism for thousands of years across several uh, cultures and countries and peoples. But that is not entirely our species. And I do teach philosophy to help uh, human beings deal with being human beings. So very much here... This gets into my favorite terrible Zizek impression. If you ever have the chance, you can watch uh, the, uh, the oh, is it The Pervert's Guide to Cinema? Or I believe it is The Pervert's Guide to Cinema, the original one. It's the first of the two Zizek movies. And he is, there is a uh, cut in with the scene of Morpheus saying, take the red pill and you wake up, take the blue pill and you go back to illusion, which the internet has made enough out of red pilling and all of that, but yes. Suddenly there's Zizek in the chair for Neo, and he says, but it's not a real choice. And he goes on and he rants for a while, and it would be hard for many people, and it is for me, to like figure out what his rant is saying. But he ends with, 
saying, I want a third pill, not a pill which shows me reality behind the illusion, but which shows me reality as illusion. What he means, as a Lacanian psychoanalyst who says we have to out-Hegel Hegel, Zizek is one of the more popular philosophers of late date, is basically saying there never is a completely coherent, agreeable reality. That is not the way our brains, bodies, minds... Remember, he is a physiochiatrist. He knows how to examine Picasso's physique, you know? So he is in touch with objective reality. There never... There is oatmeal, and that's the beeping of that. But there is never, as with the oatmeal, interrupting my uh, my lack of coherence, if there is any. There is some coherence, there is some incoherence, but there is never total coherence. There is never total 100 perfect, I, uh, perfect ideal. It's also Confucius said this, uh, said he's never met a perfect person, worked for 70 years of getting better and better. There never is totally stable, and so... What we want is not objective reality itself, static, now we're done with science, chemistry's over. What we want is a better view of how the mind and reality work objectively and subjectively, according to a continental philosopher like Zizek, or a psychologist. A psychologist? Uh, yes, something like that. Because of that, when... If you are into Zizek at all or into reading or getting familiar with Zizek, you should understand what Lacan means by the real, capital R, which is reality. Just like it is very slippery to say what Dasein is and isn't as our self or not or world or what, here or there or not with Heidegger, and Dasein is kind of the self, but it's the self as its world and everything and everybody as the they and everything. So it's, it's kind of the self, but then it's immediately not just the individual self. The real is reality for Lacan, but reality is never entirely perfectly fixed. So the real, which is good to put in scare quotes, dancy can-can fingers, suspicious. The real is a capital R word for Lacan, which means reality as we know it, which is never fully fixed reality, of course. Now, notice how that's the real, it's sort of like putting reality in quotes, which of course a lot of people, if you're more skeptical, you'd be like, well, reality, you know, is like... It's like putting reality in quotes. That is why Zizek, as a Lacanian, says, I want a third pill which shows me not reality behind the illusion, but reality as illusion. What he means specifically in terms of subjective and objective, I don't want you to strip subjectivity away from the objective because that is impossible and for fools to think about which and never arrive at. What I want is the human psychology of how the subjective is one and the same as the collective objective for us as our open-ended, harsh brain reality. That's in a sci more kind of common science-y speak what is going on here with Lacan. So, it is appropriate to use the Nazis. You don't want to go full Hitler. Like, I forget which theorist says, you know, it's chances of going full Hitler go up as you talk about any of this or anything interesting at the dinner table. To use the Nazis as an example yet again, you can suppose that an SS officer is insecure in their individual identity. So they choose to subscribe to Nazi ideology, the regime, in an attempt to secure their own self and place in the world. Lacan believed that making this situation transparent to the self is therapeutic. Dissolving paranoid narcissistic delusions and obsessions that entrap the static images of self, other, and real, which Heidegger said of thinking. We've talked enough about Nietzsche and Heidegger now that Lacan's ideas, of course, can fully uh, can fit in with that. And that said, that is what I will tell you about Lacan. So we covered uh, here narcissism as the basic human condition, the mirror stage where the image, uh, the individual, the toddler, and then for the rest of their lives, the adult tries to have a stable self. And then the real capital R would be the other Heideggerian equivalent of the world and the horizon as uh, other to the self as world, as objective to subjective. Let's put all that in quotes. Because, of course, all of this is open-ended and closed, subjective and objective, and the real capital R is actually in motion and the horizon and giving and taking, as Heidegger says. And so, the self and other, the self and world, are open and closed, and all is symbiotic and in motion. For uh, Heidegger, as well as for the Heideggerian French psychoanalyst Lacan. So, thanks for listening to that. 
Hope you have a wonderful day, life, and a relatively stable self-image, but whoever needs that? Again, as Groucho Marx said, who wants to live in an institution, no matter how many reflective surfaces they got? This is actually R.D. Lang apparently took LSD, went into an uh, insane asylum, and said, I, as a, as a physiatrist, would make less reflective surfaces or white surfaces. I'd put more nice colors, because I'm seeing my dead grandma right here. So onward from that, don't do any of that, you know, in an insane asylum. Much love, much happiness, have a wonderful life, a relatively stable self, but again, who needs it? And I will see you, or something as stable as you, perhaps, if I ever see you.